Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Dubai Air Show, where our coverage is sponsored by FLIR Systems. And we're talking to Ian Farley, who is uh, Managing Director at uh, Kinetic, uh, one of the most innovative companies in the world, a former defense uh, engineering and research uh, establishment a long time ago that was then privatized. And, and you guys have been a private company uh, for some time. Ian, you flew in this, this morning uh, on the first day of this uh, great show uh, to ink uh, a very, very important partnership for you guys uh, on uh, uh, unman uh, unmanned target or target drones uh, like the Banshee that you guys have produced for a very long time. Talk to us about that deal and why it's so so very important for you guys in, in this very important market. So we this started off with the acquisition of Mega Target Systems, which we closed in December last year. So traditionally we've grown our target, our threat representation business by exporting product from the UK. Now our corporate goal is to grow our business internationally. Naturally what we want to do is look at those export channels and how we can turn them into business opportunities. So for us, actually taking what was formerly an export channel and turning that round to a joint venture here in the UAE where we will be manufacturing targets with a partner um, to supply both the local market but then also looking at how we can export product potentially from the UAE into other Middle Eastern countries, I think really provides us an enduring business platform for the future. So it no longer becomes just a one-time export. What we build here is a capability, we build infrastructure, we transfer know-how and we truly build a business that hopefully in 15, 20 years time will be here and will be bigger. So fundamental to our international growth strategy. Um, I, I, I would say that um, I completely forgot about that deal. Uh, and so I should have been thinking Megit, but you guys owned it and then I completely forgot the fact because I'd covered it over the years many, many times. Um, the trick to those though is very, very, um, cost control really, really matters in, in that particular case. It does in all segments, but particularly that one. Talk to us about how you ensure that in these partnerships where there's always unknown unknowns, uh, not to use a, a Rumsfeldism, but there are things that you don't know, and there are challenges that emerge that add cost into that sort of equation. What's some of the thinking you're using as you go into this deal to make sure that you avoid some of those costs for something that is a very, very cost sensitive uh, item in anybody's inventory? Well, I think from a cost control perspective, actually having that local investment, that local service capability means you can be more efficient. So what we will have now is you know, a local organization of people that truly understand the customer's requirements. We can be quite intimate in terms of the planning and the design of the trials and tests that they're going to be conducting. And that really allows us to be efficient. We also then have an indigenous workforce and we're able to provide service locally. So local assets, local people, obviously trained and competent to kinetic standards. But again, we don't need to rely on international flying squads and people that are flying around the world providing a service. We can do it all locally with that intimate customer knowledge that allows us to do it efficiently. Um, uh, international business has a, uh, uh, a bad perception, whether it's in the United States uh, or it's in the UK uh, in part. Um, talk to us about, because there's the perception that when you strike deals like this, Brits are losing jobs. If you strike deals like this, Americans are losing jobs. Um, Talk to us about why deals like this are important and why it's a win-win both for you, for the customer, but also your, your workforce. Because you had kind of a very strategic answer when we were talking about this a little earlier. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a force multiplier. I mean, for us, quite simply, the future in these markets is to be able to provide an indigenous product. You know, the days of exporting from the UK are coming to a close. So our perspective is we could continue to export from the UK but there becomes a point in time where there's another indigenous provider when we lose that business. So long term we will not have a business in a market like the, like, like the UAE if we continue to export products. You know what we have to do to create a sustainable business long term are make those local investments. The UK will be part of that supply chain so even though we're going to be building a product here in the UAE it's still good for the UK, we'll still be exporting components and actually this business will then be become integral in terms of our whole global target service capability. So, you know, it, it actually becomes a force multiplier as opposed to just a discrete standalone business here that takes business away from the UK. Um, how do you maintain that engineering skill though? Because there's always a worry that as you do more of these things, it has a dilutive effect on your engineering capacity. How do you remain in the lead? Because it is an organization that literally for, for decades and decades and decades has prided itself on being on that cutting edge of innovation. Again, first as a government lab but then as a private company how do you guys how do you work that balance well, so I think we have to phase that I mean we're not going to 
Um, we're not going to move engineering responsibility to our joint venture here when we don't have people competent to be able to deliver a product or a service that meets kinetic standards. You know, so for the time being, ongoing product development will continue to be done Ashford in Kent or Medicine Hat in Canada, and you know, we will transfer that capability and those products to the UAE when we have the competence here to do it. A key part of what we want to do is to recruit, um, develop, um, you know, local hires here that obviously go through training in the UK, in New Canada. To the standards that Kinetic would expect of our operations globally. So we certainly won't be compromising, but we will be looking over time how we can migrate some of that capability into this market, retaining where necessary the high degree and the specialist skills you know, in the uh, centers of excellence that we may have in Canada or UK at the moment. And what are some of the other things you guys are highlighting here? I mean, um, you guys do have a vast array of, of products. At AUSA, we had an opportunity uh, to spend a little bit of time with uh, some of your folks on, on the unmanned land system side of things, where uh, you have something that looks like a World War I tank, but can carry a whole bunch of things and follow behind soldiers, which was very cool. Um, talk to us about some of the other things you guys are highlighting and featuring here. Yeah, so some of the opportunities we feel here, I mean, test and evaluation, we feel there's a real place for us to be able to provide much uh, more comprehensive te test and evaluation capability here, here in the UAE. So whether that's through instrumentation of the mobile ranges or whether that's working with the customer to actually help them plan, design and conduct um, you know, the appropriate level of T&E activity they have. That's one I put you into. Some of the products we have on stand, we've got Obsidian here, uh, which is a counter um, UAV um, detection system. Um, so strong interest right now in critical infrastructure, um, prisons um, type applications. Uh, we have uh, Titan Weave, which is a shape memory alloy uh, composite material that we're developing in conjunction with partners, which we see some real interesting application for in terms of airframes. Extraordinary technology. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's really potentially quite a game changer in uh, aircraft design, weight and cost saving. Why don't, why don't you tell people just a little bit about that? Because when you guys mentioned that a couple of years ago, <laughs> well, insofar as a labor, you know, but, uh, but when I heard about it a couple of years ago, I mean, it is something that's almost literally out of Star Trek or Star Wars in terms of what kind of capability it brings to the market. Yeah, shape, yeah. I mean, Titan Weave is a shape. It's a, it's, it's a composite made with a shape memory alloy, which is um, three times more resistant to uh, penetration, penetrating impact than a conventional material. So, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll much, it'll, it'll stand a much greater um, resistance towards impact, um, and to an extent, will be able to reform its original characteristics. You know, upon that impact. So, again, some fantastic benefit in air, you know, in, in, in aircraft wingtips in terms of cowlings around engines. But, you know, a, a technology that in partner with somebody that can truly take this to market, we believe there's immense commercial value in. And uh, you were talking about a couple of other things uh, as well. Would it be unmanned systems as well, like that unmanned, that very, very cool unmanned boat you have that was just doing a terrific job out there in heavy seas? Yeah, so the Hammerhead is our threat representation for a fast, in, fast inshore attack craft. Um, so this will operate up to about 45 knots. Um, we're seeing great um, you know, application for this in swarming type arrangements. So incidents like the USS Cole, uh, this is the type of threat um, that allows um, warships to conduct the right level of uh, training and test and evaluation on their systems to prevent something like that happening again. Especially since the Iranians have a lot of small boats that they would use in, in any, any one of these applications. Let me ask you one last question, and it's a Brexit-related question. Um, there is a, you know, headlines today from, from the UK were uh, a little bit sporty for, for the Prime Minister in terms of numbers of MPs calling for re resignations. There have been some high-profile departures. Sir Michael Fallon, who, who served with great distinction as Defence Secretary for the last few years, had this, was forced to step down uh, and, and he resigned uh, recently. Um, there's a budgetary review that's ongoing. There's Brexit that's going on. As the managing director of a company that's so dependent on international business, how does this complicate your strategic planning ability from a fundamental basis when you're not sure what your domestic budget's going to look like and then there are potential challenges you know, on the EU side of things where a lot of stuff is, is very undecided? What kind of challenges does that present you? So I think it's actually opportunity, to be honest, rather than challenges. So one, it provides a real impetus for us to grow our business out with the UK. So the support that I have from my CEO and our board to grow our business in the Middle East and in Asia is phenomenal. I mean, Kinetic 
wants to establish partnerships, wants to invest and wants to grow internationally and Brexit's a good driver to really create some impetus behind that. I think certainly, secondly, in terms of the impact Brexit has to us in the international perspective, to be honest, for me, it's quite limited. We tend not to do business with the European Union. We, we, have, we do business bilaterally with other nations. And I think what we're seeing, whether it's France, whether it's Germany, whether it's Sweden or other nations, Brexit's caused a real impetus to sort of increase that level of bilateral cooperation between the UK and those nations. And being an independent provider of test and evaluation capability, we're integral in some of those discussions. So for me, Brexit actually is an opportunity rather than a, rather than a problem. And what about the domestic budget challenges? You know, the defense budget is going up, but the question is whether it's ever going to go up as quickly to cover all of the things that have already been signed up for. And so there is a cabinet level review to take a look at what might have to go in order to make things, things work out. Does that, does that keep you awake at all? Not me personally, but our UK <laughs> business has a, has, a, has a perspective on that, and it's something we need to manage. <laughs> well answered. I thought I would ask you the general purpose question. But Ian, very well done. Sir, thanks very much. Best of luck and congratulations on the deal. Pleasure. Thank you very much.